television, there was a, a plane hit the World Trade Center. And then I saw the second one and uh, immediately called the White House uh, and uh, spoke with the president in a very short period of time and urged him to shut down the airspace around New York. And uh, they immediately shut down the airspace around the, around the country. And uh, who knows what else uh, may have happened if the, the president hadn't taken that step. He was in Florida, so he patched you right through. Right. What, what was his response when you, when you got him on the phone? Uh, he was very supportive, uh, offering to do anything the federal government could do. Uh, told us that uh, they had gone to the highest possible alert and were undertaking all the security steps that could possibly be taken. Uh, and then immediately after that, the, he shut down the airspace uh, around the country, to his credit. And uh, uh, I'm pleased that that step was taken. Will New York uh, airports open tomorrow? Um, we're not uh, predicting at this point. Uh, we'll stay in close touch with the, the federal emergency officials. They are calling the shots. They're uh, the ones who are in charge of the security analysis, and they'll make the determination when the uh, New York City airport should reopen. Thank you, Governor Pataki. Thanks for giving us the time. Thank you, Larry. <sighs> Next, we go to, New to Washington, D.C., where James Baker, the former Secretary of State, is standing by. Uh, is this... Uh, is this secretary, Mr. Secretary, a, a failure on the part of American policy? I don't think it's a failure on the part of American policy, uh, Larry. I think that there probably were some, perhaps some lapses in security. It would be well, I think, for us to consider beefing up some of our intelligence capabilities, particularly our ability uh, in, in the areas of human intelligence, which we have been sort of uh, de-emphasizing since the mid uh, 70s, but I don't think it's a policy failure. And uh, if by that you, you mean that it's linked somehow to what may or may not be happening in the Middle yeah. East peace process, I, I would be very leery of making uh, too direct a connection there. You know, uh, my favorite suspect here, and I have no uh, inside information uh, with respect to this, is, uh, is Osama bin Laden. He seems to be the favorite suspect of a lot of people. And this guy has done some things in the past that didn't depend on whether or not we were making progress toward peace in the Middle East or not. I mean, if you remember the bombings of the embassy in Kenya and Tanzania, the Kobar Towers bombing in Saudi Arabia. So I wouldn't uh, make too direct a, con right. a connection to the Middle East peace process. The president said we will take action and see no difference between those who committed the crime and those who harbored them. That's a direct threat against anybody around this. Do you expect to see retaliatory action soon? Well, I don't know how soon you will see it. I would expect to see it. We have contingency plans. We had them way back uh, when I was dealing with these issues uh, for the United States. And, um, and, I, and I remember well, as a matter of fact, Larry, when I was uh, meeting with uh, the foreign minister of Iraq in the lead up to the Gulf War in 1991, and I warned him against using uh, weapons of mass destruction against American forces. I said, the American people will demand retribution, and we have the means to exact it. And I think they took that uh, to heart. They didn't use weapons of mass destruction. But I think the American people, following the tragic events of today, are going to demand retribution. And I think the United States does have the means to uh, exact it, and I think we will. Sec Mr. Secretary, when you fear terrorism, as all of us have to fear it, to be logical human beings, it's around us, did you ever think of anything like this? Not anything of this scale. I mean, you have to really, you have to really be amazed, at least I'm amazed, at the degree of success. Four airplanes were hijacked, 75 percent, three out of the four, found their targets. Uh, th we haven't had a hijacking in this country in over 10 years, and yet these people were successful in hijacking the aircraft, not only hijacking them, taking control of them, flying them into their intended targets. It is rather, uh, it really is rather surprising and rather amazing. And I'm reminded also, Larry, of the successes that American counterterrorism and counterintelligence forces have had through the years. I remember during, again, during the time that I served, any number of instances where we would have a threat and we would catch it in time and we would roll it up. We would prevent it from happening. That happened over and over and over again. It didn't happen today, uh, quite tragically. We didn't catch this one. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Good seeing Thank you. you. Thank you, Larry. Good to see you.
Secretary James Baker, the former Secretary of State. Now we go back to New York. Standing by are Teresa Ward. She worked in the, the World Trade Center, in the number two World Trade Center on the 33rd floor. Bill Heitman, who worked on the 81st floor, was also working at the time of the 93 bombing. John Averone, who works at the World Trade Financial Center, that's right next door. And Tim Cavanaugh, who works about a quarter mile away from the World Trade Center. He was on the phone to a friend who works in the World Trade Center, was suddenly cut off. And Rose Arce, our CNN producer in New York, who's been on the scene. She's outside. There's Rose. All day long, it seems, on top of this. Let's start with Teresa. Where were you, Teresa? What happened? I was in my office uh, just starting my day, booting up my computer, having my coffee, and we felt the building shudder. And at first, we didn't really know what was happening, but we all sort of walked out of our offices and looked around. <clears throat> And as we looked out the window towards the West Side Highway, we saw nothing but paper and debris floating from the sky. Uh, it was, you know, overwhelming. Did you, did you panic? Actually, actually we didn't. Um, there were a lot of people in my office that were in the 93 bombing, so everyone just sort of decided to leave, and everybody left in an orderly fashion via the uh, stairs. And it was uh, very orderly. In fact, um, we, everybody was really calm. So we were fortunate in that regard. Now, is it true, Teresa, when you were outside, they told you it was okay to go back in? No, actually, what happened was we were in the stairwell. Uh, I was on the ninth floor, and there was an announcement on the PA system that basically said that um, there was an incident in One World Trade but that Two World Trade was okay and that you could return to your offices. It was okay. And at that point, a few coworkers and I jumped on the elevator and we thought for a moment about going back up, then thought better of it and decided to go down. And at that point, we had no clue what was happening with One World Trade or Two World Trade. And when we got out to the street, it was just pandemonium. Teresa, do you know why you didn't go back up despite the fact the announcement said you could? Well, you know, it just seemed like there was so much going on and we felt that it would be better as everyone was exiting the building already to just gather with everybody from my firm on the concourse level. So hmm. it just seemed like the sensible thing to do at the time and in retrospect, you know, probably saved Very a sensible. lot of lives. Good yeah. instinct. Uh, Bill Heitman worked in World Trade Center 1, the first building hit. He was working on the 81st floor. What was happening? And you were also in the 93, right, Bill? Yes, I was. Yeah. What happened uh, at the moment of impact? Where were you? What happened? At the moment of impact, I was, I was knocked out of my chair, and we just briefly panicked and, and headed towards the middle of the floor to get away from the windows. And then we headed for the stairwell and started heading down from the 81st floor in an orderly fashion. And aside from some people that were suffering from asthma, aside from some people that were suffering from asthma and some injured, it was, it was actually well-spirited going down, you know, un hmm. until we started getting down to the 30s and the 40s. Then what? And uh, the, the firemen started passing us and were collapsing on the stairs. The firemen were collapsing? Yes. Uh, just from uh, just from the load that the loads they were carrying, the oxygen tanks, the hoses. It was really it was really bad. It was uh, it was did tough you, to see these guys. Did you say to yourself, "Here we go again"? <laughs> yes, I did. But I uh, at, at this particular point, it didn't seem like it was a, a bombing. And after the initial crash going down, it it seemed like the worst of it was over. And you did, did or did not know it was a plane? Uh, we had heard when we were in the stairwell, probably, it took a total of an hour for, for me and the people that I was to get downstairs. Um, we had heard when we were about halfway down that, that a plane had, some kind of plane had hit. But we, at that point, we thought it was small. A helicopter, a small craft airplane. Hmm. Uh, as soon as you got out, what did you do? I beg your pardon? When you got out of the building, what did you do? Did you hang around or take as off? As soon as we got down to, down to the lobby level, 
I, I myself was actually surprised at the damage that there was to the concourse level of the Trade Center. I thought at that point uh, the condition would look uh, not as damaged, but as soon as we got downstairs, we were walking in ankle-deep water, uh, and there seemed to be this uh, an urgency to just get us out of the building where I thought that people were just going to be directed to like triage units or something. But once I, once I stepped outside onto the street, there was something de really wrong. Uh, and that's when I think the fear of, of the buildings collapsing uh, uh, really became apparent. And I had, only, I had only been out of the building uh, less than a minute when uh, tower number two uh, came down. Oh boy, John Ivaron, uh, you work at the World Trade Financial Center, that's next door. What, what did you see, where were you? Um, I was coming back from a um, uh, coffee break, walked onto a trading desk and saw, you know, everyone watching the TV monitors, um, which was, you know, I, thought, I didn't know what the heck was going on, I thought the market was gonna go crazy or something. Um, and then someone told me that a, a plane crashed into the World Trade Center. It sounded like a boom. It sounded like a, actually a big bomb. And that, I mean, everyone it was just was calm at first, but a couple of my traders ran by me, uh, went immediately down the stairwell and evacuate, started evacuating. I just followed them, went down to the, uh, right by the, the seaport, I guess, seaport area, um, right by the World Financial Center. and. You could just see it. I mean, it was just smoke was billowing uh, out. The booms, the booms you felt, John, were from the second plane, right? Because they were already looking at the accident of the first plane? Right, exactly. The boom was certainly from the second plane. Um, but, I mean, just, it was amazing. It was just across, just standing across the street, because my building is right across the street from the uh, World Trade Center. And, um, Boy. and just watching, there was people up on the eighth floor just waving. What did you see? Did, you, people, did any people jump? I saw 15 to 20 people jump. It was, without a doubt, it was the most... I mean, at first I saw a little debris coming out, and then you saw... It was definitely bodies the way they were... It was something you can never, ever imagine. Like, even in movies, it was... It was, it was the saddest, saddest thing I ever saw John, in my life. Was there any fear for your building and your safety? Um, absolutely. I mean, um... Being right across the street, of course, right, I guess when something like that happens, you don't start thinking about your building, but we, I mean, thank God, we, the one guy I was following just started running away, and I followed him, and um, we got to a place on, in Battery Park where you can actually, we just saw people just waving, waving for like helicopters, anything, and then just, and I guess in, in fear of getting burned or something, they just left. And so you were you were an eyewitness to death. You were an eyewitness to people yeah. jumping. Abs absolutely, oh. uh, it was it was, and I didn't realize it until you know getting home and watching on television what I'd really witnessed, and and then that's when I, I, I had boy. Yeah. assessment do you have? Right now it's a, it's a mess. It's like the down there. I mean, it's really a mess. Can you describe it a little more? What do you see? What's your role? Uh, I am actually, uh, we are tunnelers, really. We will go through the debris, uh, small cracks, where, you know, anything that we can do. Why do you do this? 
what we do. You've worked lots of things, uh, nothing comparable to this, naturally. No, nothing. I've never experienced something like this before. Well, well how long do you think this is going to take? A go long time. A long time. There's, gonna, there's, there's a lot of work to be done. A lot of work to be done. Thank you very much for speaking with us. We'll be in touch again. Okay, thank you very much, sir. Thank you. All right. Back to the New York Bureau and Tim Cavanaugh, who works about a quarter mile away from the World Trade Center. Uh, as we understand it, Tim, you were on the phone? Uh, actually, uh, my friend's brother was on the line with him, and uh, they got cut off immediately. And, um, and then I was on a conversation with his brother, and um, he told me that uh, his brother had heard the first crash and he was informing his brother of uh, what had happened. And then all of a sudden the phone got cut off from him. And uh, that was the last he's heard of his brother since. That's, I, I brought his picture so that um, maybe if there's someone out there who can see him, who has seen him, or if he's in a hospital somewhere, um, maybe someone can uh, call and let him. Can we see it? Sure. Where's the picture? It's right here on my hand. You want to hold it up? Okay, so we get a close-up of this. And he worked in the building? He worked uh, for Canna Fitzgerald on the 102nd floor. It's a um, guy I coach football with. I've known him my whole life. He's a great man. You are probably resorting to prayer. Uh, actually, I, um, what, what's, I walked from my office, which is a quarter mile away, and it was desolate. It was like a nuclear bomb had gone off, and there were ashes like in the street um like about a foot to six inches of ashes if you could imagine that walking down the street and i uh walked over to our lady of victory church which is right down the street from wall street and wall street usually they have the barricades there and there was nothing uh it was gone and um you know i was i picked up a piece of paper and i saw the paper uh and read it and it was from the hundred and like sixth floor of the World Trade Center, and I just knew that it was, you know, you couldn't imagine it. It was like being in downtown Beirut in America. Good grief. And on the scene is Rose R.C. Rose is a CNN producer in New York, a veteran CNN producer, and a very capable CNN producer. Where were you when this happened this morning, Rose? I can't hear Rose. Okay. I'm sorry, Rose. Okay. We, we, we'll we have to check back with you, Rose. We're having difficulty. Let's go to Jamie McIntyre at the Pentagon. Jamie, first, though, we've heard the briefings earlier. What kind of shape is that building in? Pretty bad shape, Larry. It's uh, nearly 12 hours after this plane slammed into the side of the Pentagon. The building is still burning. The firefighters say they have the blaze uh, contained in an area, but it's still not under control. In fact, if you look right behind my head, you can see some flames licking out, uh, licking out of the roof there. That's part of the firefighting technique of trying to cut the roof open and let the fire burn through in order to put this out. Nevertheless, uh, the Pentagon is vowing Defense Secretary Rumsfeld and President Bush, both saying that the bu building will open for business as usual tomorrow. That may be possible if they just open the other side of the building where, of course, the Secretary's office is, the Pentagon Briefing Room, the National Military Command Center, all on the other side of the building. You know, in some ways, um, there was a, a little bit of luck in today's incident in that this part of the building was under renovation. That meant that some of the new space that had just been renovated was not yet occupied, and it also uh, uh, had had improved fire retardant capabilities. And on the old side, uh, over basically in uh, this direction, the, that part of the building, people had just moved out to get ready for the next phase of renovation. So there weren't nearly as many people uh, as might have been in the building at that time of day. Nevertheless, Pentagon officials expect the death toll to be high, but they are not saying publicly and what they think that death toll will be. Larry? And Jamie, have you been able at all to see the aircraft? Well, you know, earlier today I got right up next to the building and I took a look uh, at some of the pieces that were outside. There were only very small pieces of that American Airlines jetliner, um, a cockpit that was all, a window that was all smashed, part of the uh, fuselage that was bent and twisted. But most of the parts of the plane are still inside the building, mm -hmm. according to people who have been in and seen it. Thank you, Jamie. Jamie McIntyre at the Pentagon. We have a panel of senators joining us, and before we check with them, 
Here is a, just a moment of uh, what the statement made tonight by President George Bush at the White House. Watch. These acts of mass murder were intended to frighten our nation into chaos and retreat. But they have failed. Our country is strong. A great people has been moved to defend a great nation. Terrorist attacks can shake the foundations of our biggest buildings, but they cannot touch the foundation of America. These acts shatter steel, but they cannot dent the steel of American resolve. We'll be hearing in a while from a terrorist expert, an aviation expert. We'll also be hearing from the former Secretary of Defense, uh, William Cohen, and we'll uh, be checking with others. But right now, a panel of four distinguished senators have joined us in Washington. They are Senator John Warner, Republican of Virginia, ranking member of the Armed Services Committee. Senator John Kerry, Democrat of Massachusetts, a member of the Foreign Relations Committee, including the Subcommittee on International Operations and Terrorism. Senator Dianne Feinstein, Democrat of California, member of the Select Intelligence Committee. She's chairing the Judiciary Committee Subcommittee on Technology, Terrorism, and Government Information. And Senator Fred Thompson, Republican of Tennessee, a member of the Select Intelligence Committee, a ranking member of Governmental Affairs. We'll start with Senator Warner. Was this a failure of, uh, of information techniques tonight and today, Senator? Well, Larry, I spent much of the afternoon with the Secretary of Defense and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and indeed um, had an opportunity to talk with the President from the Pentagon. That we assess tomorrow. Tonight, we grieve for those who've lost their lives, the wounded, their families, and we look upon this as the greatest tragedy in the history of our country, but also one of its finest hours, when we've seen this country come together like never before, whether it's the firemen or the rescue operators or the military all over the world, and we stand with one voice being spoken by our president, and he did very well tonight. Senator Kerry, did your, sub, did your Committee on International Operations and Terrorism ever actually fear something like this? Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. But let me join John and I know all my colleagues in just expressing, I mean, I think all of us here in Washington are, are feeling in very personal ways the, the loss of what's happened here. Uh, I know that I had one friend I know of already on that plane from Boston and I dread the learning of perhaps others, but for, for thousands of families tonight, there is just a huge loss. And I think in every American, uh, there's a sense of, there's a, there's a fury, an intense burning fury about this, and a determination to, to do what is right about it. We have always known this could happen. Uh, we've warned about it, we've talked about it. I regret to say, as a, you know, I served on the Intelligence Committee up until last year. I can remember after the bombings of the embassies after TWA 800. We went through this flurry of activity talking about it, but not really doing the hard work of, of responding. We need to do that now, and I'm confident that the size of this, uh, the, 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 the nature of this loss, and the nature of this attack are going to motivate everybody to come together to do that. And, and I think that's imperative. And we also, I think, Larry, I was heartened by the President's comments tonight need to make certain that those countries that, that sponsor terrorism, that support it, that harbor these fugitives, are as much a part of the problem as those who engage in the terrorist act themselves. And we need to make certain as a country we respond to that boldly and bravely, and not recklessly, but boldly. Senator Feinstein, what are the next few days going to be like? Uh, there's going to be opinions from, what do you, what you read on what's, what's next? Oh, I think there are many of us that feel that this was an act of war against the United States, that its loss is going, the, our, our human loss is going to be extreme, that the deviltry, the cunning, and the evil behind the act is extraordinary, um, and that we need to respond, and that America needs to come together with a unity and a purpose and respond. We cannot be a tape paper tiger. This act, in my view, it wasn't coincidence now that the World Trade Center has been the victim twice. Um, and I, I think it's a symbol of America, and it's a symbol of what we want to protect as well. 
And so I think tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock, the leadership has announced that there will be a resolution on the floor of the Senate uh, for many of us. And uh, I'm one that believes very strongly that rather than arguing over missile defense, the asymmetric threat against the United States is the most serious one. And we've had a good indication of that today. Senator Thompson, uh, President John F. Kennedy once said, when asked about his own safety, if someone is willing to give up their own life, that is almost impossible to protect against. What do you do when you have people like today, obviously in numbers more than 10 of the total four planes, who died for them, who died for this? How do you counter that? It's very difficult. I think there will always be a, a window of vulnerability that we'll have uh, we're living in a different world now. I think we let our defenses down a bit after the Cold War and wanted to enjoy the peace dividend. But the fact of the matter is the world's a more dangerous place in many respects uh, than it has been in times past. We're now seeing the other side of the technology coin. Technology has been a wonderful thing for us. But it also allows bad people to do bad things that they couldn't do a short time ago. We saw one form of that uh, today, uh, probably in the communications area. Uh, there are several other threats out there, though. The missile threat is one of them. It is, it is real. The, the cyber terrorism that could shut down our computers and our communication networks and our transportation system and all that uh, is very real. We simply have to get about uh, implementing the policies, appropriating the funds necessary uh, to, uh, to address these uh, across the board. Senator Warner, what do you say to Americans in their grief about what they should do. You try not to let terrorism affect you, but people are not going to go easily to airports tomorrow. What do you say to them? Have faith in this great country. We've survived, although this is the worst, we've survived other crises. Uh, I see tonight in Washington, among my colleagues, we're no longer Democrat, Republican. We're united as a Congress behind our president, and we're going to take every step Number one, to find out what happened and see that it cannot be repeated. And secondly, we're a nation under the rule of law, but we will relentlessly pursue and hold accountable those who perpetrated this crime against our citizens. And when we pursue that, Senator Kerry, do we, do we as a, do, does America as a nation pursue it legally? Does it go through world courts or does it uh, take off? There are three ways to pursue it, uh, Larry. One is multilaterally, which takes more time. That's the way George Bush, uh, the, the father, did it in the Gulf War. Uh, you can do it bilaterally, you and another nation. You can reach an agreement. You can work together. And you can do it unilaterally when the circumstances call for it. I personally believe this is a circumstance because of the nature of it. As Diane said, as many have said today, this is, a, this is an act of war. The difficulty is, unlike Pearl Harbor, this is a stealth enemy. Uh, Japan was identifiable. We knew where to find them ultimately, you know, and, and after chasing around, and, and we could identify. Here, we know pretty much. I mean, there's a great certainty among many people about where the fingers point. But ultimately, we don't want to be a terrorist ourselves. We have to do what we do with the knowledge and the certainty that we can determine, but we must be prepared, absolutely to move unilaterally if we need to, to protect the honor and the civility that we stand for. And I think that everybody in this country would support that based on the proper response with the proper information. Could Senator Feinstein, uh, Feinstein, a what if? What if it's yeah. bin Laden? Well, if it is bin Laden, if, well, what do you do? Well, you go into Afghanistan, you look for them, you bomb, what do you do? I, I don't think America can be a paper tiger in this instance. This was a major attack, and let's face it, there isn't going to be chaos. We're not going to bend down. We are going to rise up as one people. And it's got to be stopped. And you have to ferret it out. I agree with what Dick Holbrook said on this network earlier. You've got to work with our allies, the NATO allies, particularly Russia, China, and the moderate Arab countries. That's Egypt, that's Jordan, that's the, Saudi, uh, the Saudis. And we have to make a statement that is so strong that any country that harbors, that trains, that gives money to, that supports, becomes an enemy of the civilized world. Because if this can happen here, it can happen in other, other places. Mm -hmm.
terrorism, as our report will say very shortly, isn't a crisis, it's an ongoing condition. And we've got to, we've got to change the condition. So uh, I must say, uh, I feel very strongly about this, that the United mm. States must respond. Those of yeah. us that have had the classified briefings over a period of time understand some of the networks that are functioning out there, even in this country, as a matter of fact. And it's not too difficult to put together two and two, and I think get four. All right. Larry, Senator Thompson, can I, I just I, say I, that Putin quickly. was Putin was one of the first heads of state to call our president and the Secretary of Defense this afternoon, colleagues, I was there when he talked with the Russian Defense Minister. That's an example of the type of support we're getting. The world has got to come and help us solve this problem because terrorism is a common enemy and, to all of us. And Senator Thompson, if the state that harbors them is as responsible as those who commit it, therefore are those civilians in peril? Yes, they are. Uh, the powers that be in those nations uh, have put them in peril. Saddam uses his civilians, as we know. Uh, there's no way around that, but we've got to face up to it. I agree with Diane that uh, the greatest deterrent that we can have is the knowledge in the minds of potential terrorists around the world that there will be swift, accurate uh, uh, retribution. Uh, unfortunately, there's just no way around that. And Larry, could I just... Thank you. I, I, we uh, we're out of time, but we'll do a lot more with you in the nights ahead with all four of you and others. Um, Secretary William Cohen, the former Secretary of Defense, will be joining us as we go to meet him. There's an extraordinary scene on the Capitol steps tonight. Look at what happened. Watch. As the representatives of the people, we are here to declare that our resolve has not been weakened by these horrific and cowardly acts. Congress will convene tomorrow. September 11th, 2001. That date will inject our brains. Joining us from Washington is Senator, uh, former Senator, former Secretary of Defense, William Cohen, Chairman and CEO of the Cohen Group. Were you shocked, or was there an expectancy of something like this? Well, I, like uh, every American, every person watching this the world over, was shocked to see the act of terror actually being uh, perpetrated on the screen and the horror uh, that uh, we all witnessed. Uh, was I surprised? The answer is no. Uh, we have known for some time uh, that Osama bin Laden and other uh, organizations have uh, targeted the United States abroad and at home. Uh, we uh, formed the uh, so-called hart Rudman Commission several years ago, and they filed uh, three reports, the last of which was quite prophetic, indicating that we should anticipate acts of terrorism on American soil by terrorists who may, in fact, use weapons of mass destruction and engage in nearly simultaneous uh, types of multiple attacks. And so it doesn't come as a surprise. It comes as a surprise or shock to see uh, the horror that we have witnessed today. But. Um, uh, we have got to take more measures. I agree with much of what has been stated this evening, but we also have to take care that we don't engage in the wholesale slaughter of innocents abroad. We have to go after those groups and those who support those groups in terms of uh, our uh, responses. So we don't go in and bombs away. What do we do? Well, first of all, we have to make sure we have the right information. And we don't want to prejudge the matter, although those footprints of guilt uh, would seem to lead in one uh, very certain direction. Uh, I think we go to uh, those who are harboring uh, the uh, suspected groups and uh, serve them notice. I think President Bush did that uh, very forcefully tonight. And that uh, they must um, produce uh, those individuals, uh, and certainly they will face a number of consequences. And I don't think we have to spell them out. They will be certainly diplomatic, economic, and perhaps even military action but we should await for the president and his national security team to uh, deliver that uh, particular message. You worked there for a long time. Were you a little surprised that the Pentagon wasn't better protected? Well, uh, the Pentagon, as you know from its proximity to the airport, uh, really cannot be better protected in terms of aircraft flying uh, near the airport and uh, passing over the Pentagon itself. Uh, it's been one of my uh, worst uh, nightmares over the years uh, to be out on the parade ground or in my office and know that at any time a plane could, through either accidentally 
uh, or be directed uh, into the Pentagon itself. There is virtually no way that one can protect the Pentagon against that type of attack unless you banned all flights going into national itself, but even that might not be sufficient. So it's, uh, it's almost impossible to protect against uh, an airplane uh, engaging that type of activity. Uh, what, do, what do we do about a bin Laden? We've heard the name, we've seen him occasionally, he's obviously been involved in acts of terrorism over the year, but what do you do about someone like this? I think the first thing that we uh, should uh, resist doing, and that is focusing solely on him. Uh, to the extent that he is responsible, he will be held accountable and he will receive uh, just uh, punishment. But there may be other bin Ladens out there, and there'll be more following. What we have to do is to eliminate the climate uh, under which they're allowed to, uh, to train, to be funded, and to uh, perpetrate these acts. Uh, Senator Warner talked about President Putin calling President Bush today. I was in Moscow a year ago when one of the bombs went off destroying one of their buildings. I went on national television pledging the United States to work hand in hand with the Russian people be because they were being terrorized. And so this is an international problem. We have to gather our allies and say, this transcends all borders. When America is wounded, the rest of the world bleeds as well. And what happens here can have a dramatic impact on the life and the lifestyles of so many the world over. So we are in this together, and every American is in this together, much like we came together at the Pearl Harbor. We're coming together now, and we will respond as one nation. And Mr. Secretary, it must be asked, how did they get on these airplanes? Well, that's to be determined. Obviously, they were able to slip through the uh, security. It may have, they may have had inside assistance. You may have had a situation in which bin Laden or another group has been uh, placing sleepers for a year or so or less. We don't know exactly, uh, having assistance to uh, allow them to get on. There are many uh, ways in which that could have happened, but that's going to uh, have to await the investigation itself by the FBI and others. Thank you very much, good friend. Always good seeing him. Not under these circumstances, though. William Cohen, the former Secretary of Defense. In a moment, we're going to talk with Tim O'Brien, the CNN correspondent, close friend of the Olson family, as was this program. Barbara Olson passed away today on American Air Flight 77. Brian Jenkins with us in Los Angeles, the terrorism expert. And Arthur Wolk, famed attorney who has done a lot of work involving aviation and who is, we understand, an angry man tonight. Before we check in with Tim and Brian and Arthur, uh, tonight on the Capitol steps, the members of House and Senate gathered. Watch this. Olson is the Solicitor General of the United States. You know him very well from the many, many appearances he made before the United States Supreme Court and the Florida Supreme Court in the question over the election of uh, Bush over Gore. His wife was Barbara Olson, who appeared on this program so many times in the last four weeks, almost every night. Barbara Olson was on uh, American Air Flight 77 that left Dulles, bound for Los Angeles, and crashed into the Pentagon. I spoke to uh, Ted Olson today briefly, and it was just sad, so sad to speak to someone who had just lost his wife. Another gentleman who spoke to him was a much closer friend to the Olson family. He's Tim O'Brien, CNN correspondent. He called Ted on the phone. We understand, Tim, that you were at their wedding. I was in their wedding. I was also out of this house this afternoon, uh, after afternoon along with a number of other friends. It was a very sad afternoon. Now, she, I know he told us she called him, but he went into detail with you. What happened during that call? This is the only information we have on these terrorists. She was able to call him twice. How she could pull that off, we don't know, but she did. The phone went dead the first time after a very brief conversation, maybe less than a minute, and she called him back. Uh, and she said to him, what do I tell the pilot to do? Vintage Barbara, ready to take mm -hmm. charge. She was in the back of the plane, huddled with other passengers, and we're told uh, flight personnel and presumably the pilot. 
she said that uh, they were armed with knives and uh, box cutters, paper cardboard cutters. Uh, if uh, they were armed with uh, other weapons, such as machine guns or any kind of gun, you'd think she might have said that first, but she said no, uh, knives and box cutters. Uh, I asked Ted, did she tell you how many people were there, how many hijackers were there? And uh, Ted said no, but she referred to them in the plural, so there was more than one. What about nationality? Did you get any sense of that? No. Motive? No. Uh, but uh, and, they, were, they were all in the back of the plane, right, Tim? The pilots and the passengers were herded to the back of the 757. That's the understanding I get from Ted, correct. So whoever took over that plane was up front, and one of them had to know how to fly it. Presumably that's the case, yeah, but you know, that, that's speculation and we don't know for sure. It's conceivable there was a co-pilot who still may have been in the cockpit. We don't know, but there were flight personnel and most of the passengers huddled in the back. Incidentally, Barbara was not supposed to be on that flight today. Her original plan was to fly to California yesterday. Today is Ted Olson's birthday and uh, she wanted to be with him last night. And uh, so that was the cost. Uh, and when she was on the phone, Ted had already known about the crashes in New York, right? That is correct, and he did tell her about that, so she had a good idea of what she was up against. She knew about the two crashes at the World Trade Center. Uh, you, Tim, you stay with us. Brian Jenkins, you're an expert on terrorism. You've been involved in things like this for a long time, but nothing compared to this. Were you shocked? Uh, shocked, but not surprised. Uh, not surprised. Not surprised, no. The possibility of, of a large-scale terrorist attack on this country is something that uh, we have anticipated for a long time. Uh, there have been previous incidents involving multiple coordinated attacks. We have dealt with uh, previous situations where it was either threatened or certainly a concern of the authorities that a hijacked aircraft would be crashed into uh, a, a, a into the middle of the city. But from what Miss Olson described them as having, how do they how do they get on the plane with that? Well, it it it, it depends. I mean, that's that's difficult to say, and we, we we don't know. I mean, people do board aircraft with with all sorts of 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 small things. Uh, and I get I, on and potentially and potentially get on. I, I suspect that's going to change now. But I mean, people board aircraft with with small pen knives. Uh, they board aircraft with various kinds of, uh, of, of metal objects. Um, it, it does, however, uh, uh, raise some questions about how they were able to get on the aircraft and take control of the cockpit. This is not a standard hijacking where somebody seizes a passenger hostage and, and uh, orders and, a pilot to fly to another city. And, in fact, in three of the four operations, they succeeded. They did the succeed. The one that went down in Pennsylvania was obviously heading for Washington, is that correct? And something I, must have happened. Uh, that, that's a safe presumption. Arthur Wolk, you're an expert at uh, aviation accidents. You've been involved in the courts, many uh, often dealing with this, and we understand you're quite angry at this. Why? Well, because it's, to me, it's, it's disgusting to hear the platitudes of the politicians inside the Beltway saying that the government is in charge. I thought the government was in charge this morning. Where was the government yesterday, five months ago? or a year ago when this was unfolding? Where were the national security agencies that are supposed to protect us from this? Where are ally, our allies who are supposed to be part of this anti-terrorist network? Why are there no sky marshals on aircraft anymore? Was that a budgetary consideration of the FAA? Maybe that could have stopped it. So what bothers me, Larry, is that we're talking about burying what may be 25,000 people. There weren't supposed to be any more Pearl Harbors. We put in place a system to prevent this from happening. This was not a, a minimal terrorist act. This was something that required the cooperation of many, many people. And I don't understand, uh, and I'm sure many of our viewers don't understand, how this could possibly happen. Where was the government? All right, before I have Brian respond, Tim O'Brien, I know you're a reporter, so you're going to be objective about this. Does Mr. Wolk have a point? I think he does have a point. How much of a point depends on perhaps where you sit. Certainly there are some security breaches here. Uh, one of your guests pointed out that we haven't had a terrorist hijacking in 10 years, and maybe we have gotten a little lax. But we also have to recognize when people are willing to give up their lives to stage something like this, it's going to be very hard to stop under any circumstances. And Brian, what do you make of what Arthur said? 
I mean, obviously, well, there was a failure. Today. There clearly was a failure, no question about it. We have to determine uh, what happened with regard to intelligence, what happened with regard to security. Uh, but at the same time, we have to realize that there is an ongoing war, that there's a constant flow of information, threats, warnings, uh, information passed on by intelligence agents. And many times, by evacuating an embassy, by issuing a, uh, an alert, by raising the level of security, these attacks are thwarted. Those victories are invisible because you can't count things that don't occur. We could have averted uh, 14 things last month. It, it, I, I, it we is didn't know about it. It is entirely possible. What we do see, and, and certainly saw dramatically uh, uh, today, are the failures. When the intelligence fails, when the security fails, uh, that's what we were faced with uh, uh, today. Can we, can we achieve, can we get better on security? Yes. Can we provide absolute security? Absolutely not. Arthur, it, uh, you know, as, uh, as I quoted earlier, if someone wants to give up their life, that's awful hard to contain, isn't it? Larry, I think uh, I, I agree with that. I think that we, we are supposed to have a system in place to prevent this from happening. And you can't stop terrorism at the gate at the airport. You stop terrorists before they enter the country. You stop them by investigating their cells when they're in the country. You uh, uh, avoid this by exercising as much security uh, uh, operations as you possibly can. I'm no expert in security. I'm just a guy who saw it on CNN Live today. And all I can tell you is that there weren't supposed to be any of these in this country. And the people who are supposed to have been in charge were asleep at the switch, in my opinion. And also, since you're an expert on pilots and things, were you surprised that whoever did this was able to commandeer these pl aircraft? Not able really. Able to fly them? Not really. Remember, we have no sky marshals on the aircraft, so we have no one armed on aircraft randomly to prevent this from happening. The door that separates the cockpit from the rest of the airplane is really just a symbol of security. It's not real security. And finally, it doesn't take a, a, someone who's a rocket scientist to fly an airplane once it's airborne and to fly it into a building. So you don't have to be a sophisticated pilot to accomplish this, sadly. All right, let me, uh, let's do what we haven't done yet today. And since this is a special edition of Larry King Live, and we'll be doing this, of course, throughout the week in CNN 24 hours a day, let's include the audience. Knoxville, Tennessee, hello. Uh, yes, sir, Mr. King. I was wondering uh, what you and the panel thought about uh, the possibility of uh, the United States Army shooting down the plane over Pennsylvania. I know the Pentagon has denied it. But if they knew that plane was heading for D.C., is it possible that they did? And if they didn't, would they have later if it had gotten farther? Yeah, Tim, supposing, this is supposing, a plane's heading in, it's got passengers, it's going to go to the White House or the Camp David. Do you shoot it down? If there's that threat, uh, you may have to, but certainly there are steps that can be taken before that threat materializes. First, you try to make contact with that plane, find out where it's going. But if it appears headed for the White House or the Pentagon or the Capitol or Camp David and it's off route, that may be the only alternative you have. And it would you make agree, sense. You agree, Brian? Uh, in some cases, yes. The reality, however, in, in, in terms of major urban, urban areas, airports are located in urban areas. Uh, uh, planes take off. It's not a long flight from Dulles to the Pentagon. It's not a long flight from some of the airports uh, in the northeastern part well, of the United States to the New York. How about the caller, though? You've got a plane, you know it's diverted. It's that, obviously not going to San Francisco. That, that certainly, that certainly is, is one of those horrible decisions that, that someday, I suppose, someone is going to have to make. St. Louis, hello. Hello. Um, my question is, we seem to have become very complacent, and we're being very sophisticated and very rational about how to respond to this. However, on all of the channels, um, and especially on CNN, which, by the way, I think has done a fabulous job, um, Osama bin Laden seems to be the prime suspect here. We've heard his name for years, and he continued to operate. And my question is, he supposedly three weeks ago gave notice that this was going to happen. Where was everyone? Who dropped the ball? I know there's only so much you can do, and you said they might have averted 14 other incidents last month, but no one averted this yeah. incident. Tim, was that a fact? Did we know that bin Laden had made some sort of threat three weeks ago? There was knowledge that he made some kinds of threats, but they were general, and there was nothing new about that. He's making threats all the time. I think this may underscore the point made by Senator Feinstein earlier in the show, that 
is not just an attack or a war that we must declare on individual terrorists, but rather on terrorism itself. Wherever it exists, uh, the United States and other countries should be working to uh, eradicate it, root and branch, or sooner or later it may strike home, as Brian? it did today. Um, I, I, I agree that uh, Osama bin Laden certainly does make threats all the time. We, we, we can shut down the country. I mean, the number of threats coming in from Osama bin Laden, not just Osama bin Laden, but, but other organizations, against the United States is a continuing flow of information. There probably has not been a day in the last 10 years when there were not terrorist threats made against uh, the United States somewhere in the world. And Larry, and that, Walt, that's just yeah. the point, you see. That, that's just the point. Terrorism didn't start yesterday. It didn't start last year. In fact, we both remember for the last 30 years or 40 years we've been talking about the seriousness of terrorism. It's really about time that we get our act together so that we, do, we don't wring our hands after the terrorist act has already occurred and people have lost their lives. We're supposed to be able to prevent this stuff. You know, this is, they call it the 21st century threat. Well, it may be the 21st century threat, but we have the 21st century capability to deal with this threat. And Do obviously we have to, we're not are dealing you with that every flight in America should have... Uh have secret people on board watching the flight, that it should be treated as El Al treats every flight? If that's what it takes, then that's what we have to do. Indianapolis, hello. Good evening, Larry. Hi. Uh, like many Americans, I watched in horror from work today, all day long. My question, Ashley, the question my, I was asked by my 13-year-old when she got home from school, is this going to change our entire way of living? Not in the sense of being afraid, but what about fuel prices? Uh, today I went to work. Gas was a buck sixty-two. I come out of work. It's three and four dollars a gallon. Really? What about our economy? Tim, what 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 do you think the most stark changes will be? I'm less worried about fuel prices than civil liberties, which uh, may be sacrificed uh, in the aftermath of this, and it may that may have to be the case. A great Supreme Court justice once said, "The Bill of Rights is not a suicide pact." Mm -hmm. We'll have to take steps to protect ourselves, and some of those steps we may find repugnant today, but they may become necessary. I think that should be of concern to everybody. Brian? Well, I, the, the fact is that uh, we have found in, in, in other places where terrorist campaigns have been waged, uh, life does go on. Uh, nonetheless, it, changes, it? It, it does change in a way where, where we will see probably... Or do we get complacent? The, if nothing happens for years and years, then inevitably we will get complacent again. However, uh, this episode, the magnitude of this, is going to leave a deep scar on the psyche of the American people. Now, that can turn into the kind of resolve, the kind of determination that the previous guests have been talking about. But it also can make us, in some cases, a more callous, harder-edged people. Uh, we are where the United States probably was on now, December 8th or 9th, 1941. This generation, which felt so safe, has never experienced anything like this. This is greater, probably, in casualties, I suspect, than, than the London Blitz. And Arthur Walk, do you now want uh, massive lines at airports? Do you want intensive security? Do you want people to get to the airport three hours before a flight? No, on the contrary, I think that the system we have in place needs to be made better. I think we need sky marshals on aircraft, but I think the people who are responsible for our security, both domestically and internationally, have to get down to work. That's really the problem. Tim O'Brien, we began this segment, and by the way, CNN, of course, will be on top of this 24 hours a day, and we'll have more special guests tomorrow night as well here on Mary King Live. But Tim, I, I want to leave on, on Barbara. I understand Rudy Giuliani is in New York. Rudy? Yeah, essential, then obviously do it. The upper part of Manhattan will be open. But if tomorrow is a day in which you want to stay home and stay with your family and uh, give comfort and support maybe to other people that have been affected by this, it would, it would be a good day to do that. No more, no more. Yeah, I, I, the point that Richie Shura makes is we... Uh, People are wonderful, and, and, we, and I mean this in the best sense of the word. We've had thousands and thousands of people that have come to help us. When I was down at the site near the World Trade Center, I met uh, a lot of the um, a lot of the National Guards people that the governor has sent. Uh, really wonderful young men and women. Uh, we have enough volunteers now.
I mean, we have more volunteers, frankly, than, than we need at this point. And what we need to do is to focus the efforts of the professionals that are there in being able to do the recovery and try to save as many lives as we can and restore services as quickly as possible. We, we may be asking for more volunteers tomorrow and the next day and the day after, but right now we don't need any, any more volunteers. Mr. Mayor, is there still hope that there are people who are yes. still alive and well? Yes, there's hope. There's hope that there are there there, there will be there are people that are still that are that, they're, that are still alive. How and is the rescue effort hampered by this darkness? What do you what do you we, we moved we um, we moved a lot of lights in uh, so that the area is being lit now. So that I don't I don't think the rescue effort is is going to be hampered by the darkness. The rescue effort is hampered by the fact that there's still fire there. There are still still unsound structures, and it's still dangerous. Although the rescue effort is now taking place, but if you're asking me, is it hampered? It's hampered because of the conditions, not because of the of the nighttime. Can you, you said, concerned about long succession of uh, heavy bulldozers and other heavy construction equipment making its way down to Lower Manhattan. Uh, what is that going to be used for? That's going to be used to move debris out of the way, so that the emergency vehicles can get in and out uh, quickly, so that we can get the ambulances in. We in a in a more expeditious fashion than we've been able to do. And I want to thank the Deputy Mayor Rudy Washington, who has spent most of the day coordinating, getting all of that emergency equipment in the right place, uh, ready to move. It's, if, you go, if you go along Houston Street, you'll see hundreds and hundreds of pieces of equipment that are lined up to move in and to take debris out. And now they've started doing that. And I think that's probably what you observed. You Mr. probably Mr. observe Mayor, them starting the other. Are you concerned about the city tonight in light of what all the things that have happened during the daylight hours today? Am I concerned from the point of view of the actions and activities of the people of the city? The police department is out in large numbers. You, you want to explain the, the, uh, the force that you have out there? And No, I'm not concerned. But we're, uh, we're pretty much out in full force this evening. Uh, Southern Manhattan, as you know, we're, uh, we're primarily concentrating on the rescue efforts. Um, the rest of the city is, is basically some of the entry points are shut down. Um, the tunnels uh, are shut down. Uh, as of midnight, uh, there will be no more traffic coming into Southern Manhattan from 14th Street. We're going to shut that down. Uh, I think the city's pretty secure, um, and we're going to continue doing what we're doing uh, in the rescue effort and, uh, and just hope for the best. Absolutely not. Uh, there's been no reports of, of looting or, or any other problems uh, out of the ordinary. Uh, and as I said, the, the boroughs are uh, are working uh, pretty normally, um, and uh, so far so good. Mayor, did you see the president's comments tonight? And have you spoken to him again? Sir? No, I spoke to him earlier today. And uh, I only heard the very end of his comments because I was coming back from the World, the World Trade Center. Uh, he said we, thousands. He said thousands of uh, I, I don't know the number at this point. Uh, I have, and that may be very, very well be the case. At, at this point, uh, we're, we're still in the effort of trying to. I don't know the numbers yet, but I, I mean, this is going to be, a, as I said, the numbers are going to be very, very high. Uh, Mr. Mayor, just if you think of the number of people that were in the building at the time, we've been spending time with the medical examiner, who, by the way, was injured himself. And uh, so uh, Dr. Hirsch was, was um, injured and had to be treated, but he's organized his office, and they are, they are ready to deal with thousands and thousands of, of bodies if they have to. Mr. Mayor, earlier in the day, and we'll give them the support and the help to do that. Um, he was down there, yes. And he got, he got, uh, he got injured. I mean, uh, he's okay, but he's obviously he, he was he was uh, hurt. He was beaten up pretty badly. His, his body hurts, and he was beaten up. Well, no, I mean, I mean, he was his body was he got hit with, with debris. He, no, no, no one beat him up. He got hit. <laughs> he described it that way. I said, "How do you feel, Doctor Hurst?" He said, "I got pretty beaten up." And then uh, what what happened is he got hit with debris. Mr. Mayor, we weren't sure exactly what the radius of damage was like, what blocks were involved, how much debris had fallen on surrounding areas. If you go down there now, uh, the last time I saw it was when I was I was leaving uh, this this morning. It's horrendous. I mean, it, um, 
it's uh, filled with debris, it's filled with dust. Um, it's going to be a heck of a cleanup effort. How far down Battery Park City was that affected? That, well, the, the uh, power is out in the lower part of Manhattan on the west side. So there is no power at this point. So that's why we had to bring in the lights to light up the area so that they can do the, re the rescue effort. And the people that live at Battery Park City have been ev evacuated. They, they were taken to New Jersey. So I don't know when that'll be back. That'll, that'll, that's going to take a while for that to come. Uh, so on the, the, west, the, 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 the east side, the east side of, um, of uh, downtown Manhattan has power. And exactly where the demarcation line uh, is, I'm not, I'm not sure. But uh, over, over by one police plaza going east, there's power. And I believe there's power at City Hall now. Yes. What, what, are your, what are your plans for the rest of the night, for the next 12 hours? And My, uh, will you all still be... Will be well, uh, we, we just had a, uh, a long meeting with all of the agencies to make sure they have the support that they need. Uh, they'll all reassemble here at uh, 8, 9 o'clock tomorrow morning. And some of the critical people <coughs> will stay here uh, throughout the night, and we'll have representatives here. And I'll be here for a while longer. Are we concerned about asbestos contamination? We, we, uh, the health department has done uh, tests and at this point is not concerned. But so far all the tests that have, we've, been, we've, we've done do not show an undue amount of asbestos. It doesn't show any particular chemical agent that we have to be concerned about. The, the accumulation of it for people who are down there can become very, very uh, irritating. And there were a lot of people whose eyes have been burned, and, but, I, but, I, but I don't think there's any chemical agent that we have to worry about Mr. at Mike, this point. Is there any idea how many police officers and firefighters you are missing? Yes, we have an idea of how many we're missing. Can you tell us that? Well, we, it's, we're, a it's, a, it's a lot. I, it's a, it, it, it's a lot. A lot, of, a lot of firefighters and a lot of police officers. And uh, I don't know that, it, I, I really don't want to get into a numbers game until we know. It's a lot, it's a lot. There are also reports that there are some cops grass in both departments. Too. Yes, we lost, we lost um, the deputy chief of the fire department and uh, the chief of the department. The chief of the fire department? The chief of the fire department. The first deputy commissioner, Feehan. Deputy Commissioner Feehan, Chief Gancy, Father Judge, and Ray Downey, who um, I just gave a par party for at Gracie Mansion for his years of service to the fi fire department who led o our team in the Oklahoma City bombing rescue. We've also lost him. It's very difficult for you, Mr. It's very difficult, uh, not just for me, for the fire commissioner and, um, and there were some, very, some other very close friends that are missing right now. I haven't been able to speak to their families yet. Mr. Mayor, I'd like to get some New Yorkers who are still concerned about going to work and things like that. The, uh, the, ver the very best thing would be to stay home tomorrow. Uh, if you have to come to work and you work uh, north of uh, 14th Street, then uh, you can come to work if it's critical. So if it's important and it's critical, then you come to work. But if you can stay home tomorrow, you're going to make things easier on yourself and easier on the city if you stay home. So uh, the city is not officially closed. Manhattan is not officially closed north of 14th Street. But we're advising people if you can stay home, it would be better. Outside of Manhattan, uh, you go to work and do all the things you would normally do. There's no, there's no uh, particular reason to be constricted in activities there. But if, if you can stay out of the city, that would, that would be good. Any idea when the airports will reopen? Uh, I, I, I believe uh, not, not before uh, 2 o'clock tomorrow, but that, that was the report we had uh, a, a while earlier. So at, at least uh, closed until then. Mr. Mayor, um, Arab Americans repeated issued a statement condemning the attack um, and asking for Americans and New Yorkers to withhold judgment until after an investigation had been completed. But they're also concerned about the fact that Muslim communities here in New York will be targeted for harassment both by law enforcement officials and by community members because of the nature of the attack. No, just, uh, just the opposite. They will, they will receive extra protection. Uh, 
That, that's the point of what I was saying earlier. Nobody should engage in group blame. Uh, the reality is wh whoever is responsible for this, uh, law enforcement will figure that out. The United States government will figure it out. And the retaliation will be, will be I'm sure, very, very strong and uh, make an example out of those people. But uh, nobody should try to make that determination on their own. Nobody should blame any group of people or any uh, nationality or any ethnic group. The particular individual is responsible and the group's responsible. That's up for, to law enforcement and it's up to the United States government to figure out. And citizens of New York should, um, even if they have anger, which is understandable, and very, very uh, strong emotions about this, uh, it isn't their place to get involved in this. Then, then they're just participating in the kind of activity we just witnessed. And New Yorkers are not like that. So we're sensitive to that. The police department will have special patrols in those areas of the city. And anybody that tries to do anything like that will be arrested. Mr. Mayor, is there anything you could say to put to rest of the fears people have? Uh, everything is being done to try to make the city as secure as possible. Uh, the, the president, uh, the FBI, the federal government, the state, the governor, uh, the New York City Police Department, law enforcement authorities, everything is being done that ca can be done. And uh, people should, people, people tonight should say a prayer for the people that we've lost and be, and be grateful that we're all here. And tomorrow, you know, tomorrow um, New York is going to be here and we're going to rebuild, and we're going to be stronger than we were before. Last question. Last question. Police Commissioner Karras, did you lose any top people in your department? No, we, not to my knowledge, not at this point. Uh, we have suffered losses. Um, there, uh, there was a contingent of, uh, of cops that was with the mayor and I, and uh, Chief Ganji and, um, and First Deputy Meehan, uh, the mayor and I left them. Uh, we were gone about 10 minutes when the, that portion of the building fell. And uh, I had a number of people there. Uh, uh, we haven't found them yet. Um, uh, so I don't know the numbers. Uh, I don't know yet. We're still hopeful that we're gonna, that we're gonna find people. And, and we, we, have do, not, we have not given up hope that we're gonna, we're gonna be able to find some people. We, we do know there are people in the building that are alive. We know that for a fact. Uh, I can't get into it right now, but we do know there are people in the building that are alive, uh, and we're making every effort to get to them. Are those members of the SOTA police officers? Excuse me? Are those police officers? There are some police officers, yes. How many Which building are they in? Uh, two that we know of. How many? Two? Two. Which building there? Which building? We, I can't say right now. Have police officers been pulled from the rubble already alive? Yes, there are a number of people that were taken to the hospitals. Can people be hurt from yes. inside the rubble? Is that how you know? Can people be hurt? Uh, I can't get into it right now. Thank we you. Have, Thank we, you. We have a group of shelters that, um, that are available in Manhattan. Bayard Rustin High School, Seward Park High School, Washington Irving High School, the High School of Fashion Industry, Chelsea High School, Norman Thomas, the City School, JS-22, IS-131, Comprehensive Day and Night, they're all open for, um, for people that may need uh, shelter tonight. And we'll put out this list, as well as Curtis High School in Staten Island and Westinghouse High School in Brooklyn. So we'll put out this list, and these, these, are, these shelters are all available to people who may, who may be displaced. Thank you. That was uh, Mayor Rudy Giuliani in a late evening press conference in New York discussing the events of the day and the precautions taken by the city. This is the end of Larry King Live, but I did want to say a word and hold Tim O'Brien over, too, about Barbara Olson. Barbara appeared on this show many times, as you know. Sometimes her opinions could be infuriating, but I, you could not love her. You could not not love her. She was just... Barbara was a doll. Do you agree, Tim? Is Tim O'Brien there? When you agree that there, she was a special lady? Oh, I'm sorry, Tim is not there. I thought he had stayed over. Anyway, she was a special lady. We will all miss her. I can't imagine doing one of our panel debates and not having Barbara Olson. And to, to her wonderful husband, Ted, the condolences of all of us here at CNN. We'll be back tomorrow night. Stay tuned for a CNN special report. America under attack.
a CNN special report, America Under Attack. Here's Paula Zahn in New York, Wolf Blitzer in Washington, and Bill Hemmer in Atlanta. Good evening, everyone. You've heard some of our leaders calling today one of the worst days in American history. You are joining us now some 13 hours after two hijacked commercial airlines crashed into the World Trade Center, taking down the North Tower, taking down the South Tower, as well as an adjoining building. Some 50,000 people worked in this complex. As I look behind me tonight, a disturbing sight, and after we look at the shot, we will try to uh, fast forward to this evening. No trace of what used to be the tallest buildings in New York City, just a smoldering black hole. The Empire State Building, now the tallest building in the city. The strikes happened 18 minutes apart, the first one at 8.45. By 10.30, both towers had collapsed. An untold number of victims are still trapped inside the wreckage of the building. Mayor Giuliani and uh, the, the uh, police chief confirming they believe there are people who are still alive. Unfortunately, rescue workers cannot get to them at this hour because of falling debris, because of smoke, and because of structures of buildings that might continue to collapse. Mary Giuliani said the death toll could be horrendous. He said the numbers are going to be very, very high. What we can tell you tonight is the city is confirming that some 265 firefighters are believed to be dead. The police chief saying among the dead, the chief of the fire department as well as the deputy chief, some 85 police officers missing tonight. CNN's Peter Viles takes us back to the start of this dreadful day. I need to warn you, the pictures are graphic. Some of you might find them disturbing. Just before 9 a.m. Eastern, Americans awaken to shocking pictures from New York. I just saw the entire uh, top part of the World Trade Center explode. Minutes earlier, at 8.45, a hijacked plane had slammed into one of the World Trade Center towers. 9.03 a.m., a sickening sight. A second plane crashes into the Trade Center. See the damage to that about the middle of the building. Just incredible what we are witnessing here. People on the ground look on in horror as workers in the Trade Center towers fall, or maybe even jump, to their deaths. 9.30 a.m., the president in Florida. Uh, today, we've had a national tragedy. Uh, two airplanes have crashed into the World Trade Center in an apparent terrorist attack on our country. Is the airport being evacuated? They need to go home. 9.40. All American airports have been closed, but there are still planes in the sky. And minutes later, one of them crashes into the Pentagon. Several Army officers I talked to reported hearing a, a big explosion, seeing shards of metal. <laughs> 59 as the Pentagon burns the south tower of the World Trade Center buckles and collapses <laughs> 1029 the second Trade Center tower collapses an American landmark is in ruins here it comes I'm getting behind a car thousands feared dead lower Manhattan shrouded in smoke and debris 10.48, police in western Pennsylvania confirmed that a fourth hijacked plane crashed a half hour earlier outside Pittsburgh. Enormous loss of life. Please. Noon, shock and disbelief. As the dead and wounded are taken to East Coast hospitals, officials in New York and Washington report a shortage of blood and appeal to Americans to donate their blood. Late afternoon, New Yorkers are evacuating Lower Manhattan by the thousands. Parts of the city unrecognizable. A third building at the Trade Center, this one 47 stories, collapses. At Bellevue Hospital, an official says, quote, it is a catastrophe of unparalleled proportions. Peter Vile, CNN, New York. And if you were with us through Mayor Giuliani's news conference, you can see how tough it is for anybody to sort out the magnitude of what this city endured as well as what Washington endured today. Uh, I was on the phone earlier with a city official who believes the death toll will go into the thousands. Once again, that is impossible to even get a sense 
of the number of injuries and the number of deaths because of the fact that rescuers simply cannot get in to that perimeter area surrounding the World Trade Center because of fears of, of further structural collapse. Uh, I wanted to let you know what uh, we can also tell you New Yorkers can expect in the morning. The city from 14th Street down will be closed off to civilians at least until Thursday. All New York City public schools, parochial schools, and private schools will be closed tomorrow. All, uh, as I mentioned, all businesses below 14th Street will be closed as well. The nation's airports have been completely shut down at least until noon Eastern on Wednesday. The stock markets, as you can see on the screen, will also be closed. Uh, and you know that uh, the news from the Asian markets that are now opening is not good, uh, opening to a 17-year low. Uh, but once again, uh, New Yorkers are going to wake up to a, uh, a skyscape they barely recognized. The two towering World Trade Towers no longer exist. And Wolf, uh, throughout the next hour, we will hope to be bringing you more information from some of the trauma centers in the area that are trying to, to treat patients. We know for a fact some 300 uh, victims are being treated at St. Vincent's Hospital, and uh, we're going to go to our reporter live there uh, to get a better sense of uh, what their condition is at the moment. Paula, President uh, Bush was very succinct in his remarks tonight, insisting, quote, Today, our nation saw evil, confirming the worst fears when he said this, thousands of lives were suddenly ended by evil, despicable acts of terror. He began this day on a routine assignment in Florida, promoting his education agenda when he got the word uh, of the, uh, uh, the plane crash, the plane attack on the uh, World Trade Center towers in Manhattan. He was immediately flown shortly thereafter to Barksdale Air Force Base in Louisiana for security considerations uh, his security personnel not believing it was safe yet to return to washington from barksdale he was flown to offit uh, air force base in nebraska home of the strategic command uh, where he remained for several hours participated in a telephone conference call with his national security advisors eventually it was determined that it was safe for him to return to andrews air force base outside of washington he came out in under unprecedented escort uh, uh, protection from F-15s and F-16s eventually landing at Air Force uh, Andrew, uh, and Andrews, uh, Andrews Air Force Base outside of Washington. We're taking a look at some of those escorts that accompanied Air Force One on the way to uh, back to Washington. And once he landed at, at Andrews, he was flown by Marine One, the Marine helicopter, to the south lawn of the White House. Once again, almost unprecedented decoy helicopters, Marine helicopters, uh, joining him in order to get to uh, the White House. The president spoke for just under five minutes, and he spoke from the heart. Good evening. Today, our fellow citizens, our way of life, our very freedom came under attack in a series of deliberate and deadly terrorist acts. The victims were in airplanes or in their offices, secretaries, businessmen and women, military and federal workers, moms and dads, friends and neighbors. Thousands of lives were suddenly ended by evil, despicable acts of terror. The pictures of airplanes flying into buildings, fires burning, huge, huge structures collapsing, have filled us with disbelief, terrible sadness, and a quiet, unyielding anger. These acts of mass murder were intended to frighten our nation into chaos and retreat. But they have failed. Our country is strong. A great people has been moved to defend a great nation. Terrorist attacks can shake the foundations of our biggest buildings, but they cannot touch the foundation of America. These acts shatter steel, but they cannot dent the steel of American resolve. America was targeted for attack because we're the brightest beacon for freedom and opportunity in the world. And no one will keep that light from shining. Today, our nation saw evil, the very worst of human nature. And we responded with the best of America, with the daring of our rescue workers, with the caring of, for strangers and neighbors who came to give blood and help in any way they could. 
Immediately following the first attack, I implemented our government's emergency response plans. Our military is powerful and it's prepared. Our emergency teams are working in New York City and Washington, D.C. to help with local rescue efforts. Our first priority is to get help to those who have been injured and to take every precaution to protect our citizens at home and around the world from further attacks. The functions of our government continue without interruption. Federal agencies in Washington, which had to be evacuated today, are reopening for essential personnel tonight and will be open for business tomorrow. Our financial institutions remain strong and the American economy will be open for business as well. The search is underway for those who are behind these evil acts. I've directed the full resources of our intelligence and law enforcement communities to find those responsible and to bring them to justice. We will make no distinction between the terrorists who committed these acts and those who harbor them. I appreciate so very much the members of Congress who have joined me in strongly condemning these attacks. And on behalf of the American people, I thank the many world leaders who have called to offer their condolences and assistance. America and our friends and allies join with all those who want peace and security in the world. And we stand together to win the war against terrorism. Tonight, I ask for your prayers for all those who grieve, for the children whose worlds have been shattered, for all whose sense of safety and security has been threatened. And I pray they will be comforted by a power greater than any of us, spoken through the ages in Psalm 23. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. This is a day when all Americans from every walk of life unite in our resolve for justice and peace. America has stood down any enemies before, and we will do so this time. None of us will ever forget this day, yet we go forward to defend freedom and all that is good and just in our world. Thank you. Good night, and God bless America. President Bush speaking at the White House almost two hours ago from the Oval Office, his first nationally televised Oval Office address. Our senior White House correspondent, John King, is at the White House. John, from that address, the president met with his top national security advisors. What do we know about that meeting? That's right, Wolf. The president immediately proceeded to that meeting at the White House Situation Room. It lasted a little under an hour, we are told, on the national security side. The president was brought up to speed on U.S. military deployments around the world, including the status of U.S. forces in the Persian Gulf region, as well as the deployment today of naval vessels from Norfolk, Virginia, up along the eastern seaboard of the United States. Also, that meeting was expanded beyond the normal national security meeting in a way to take into account the devastating effect of this tragedy. The Transportation Secretary, the Health and Human Services Secretary, and the Director of the Federal Emergency Management Agency brought into that meeting as well to discuss with the President and his national security team the steps the federal government is taking to try to deal with the devastation of this. Now, we are told from sources earlier today that senior administration officials told key members of Congress that they are, quote, certain, based on the evidence they have gathered so far, confident, I'm sorry, not certain, confident, based on the evidence gathered so far that people and organizations associated with Osama bin Laden are responsible for this. But coming out of the national security meeting tonight, I was told by a senior administration official they do not want to jump to conclusions here. The administration will say nothing publicly about that. This official saying, quote, we're going to take a little time to sort this out. So the president being briefed by his team, he is here at the White House tonight. That meeting is now over. But look for the president tomorrow to have more public events the goal here is to send reassuring signals to the American people. We are told the first order of business tomorrow is a bipartisan meeting with the congressional leadership here at the White House. Wolf. And John, the uh, president was also sending a very powerful signal to the enemies of the United States when he said this. Let me read this line from his speech. He said, we will make no distinction between the terrorists who committed these acts and those who harbor them, which suggests that uh, some states may eventually be paying a price if the U.S. concludes that they were responsible as well. It certainly does. The president's very strong words there come at a time this administration and 
especially the prior administration, had been criticized for some by not taking stronger actions against the governments that have provided safe harbor and financial support to Osama bin Laden. Again, the administration publicly not assigning any blame, but we do know from the intelligence briefings provided to key members of Congress, that is the administration's at least a preliminary conclusion. Again, three sources I spoke to on Capitol Hill say administration officials used the word confident that the evidence they were gathering so far pointed to the bin laden organization well all right john king stand by at the white house i want to bring in our military affairs correspondent jamie mcintyre he's at the pentagon which saw devastation there as well uh, jamie first of all what do we know about the casualty count at the pentagon well wolf just a short time ago we got the first uh, estimate of how high the death toll may be here at the pentagon it could be as many as 800 people killed according to Arlington County fire officials who say they've been told by Pentaga, uh, Pentagon officials that the range of missing persons here is somewhere between 100 and 800. So that's the range uh, that the death toll could take here at the Pentagon. Arlington County fire officials also say that the work tonight uh, as uh, the fires continue to burn here at the Pentagon is to remove some of the debris, take some of the front of the facade off so that firefighters can go in in the morning in full force and try to put out uh, what remains of the uh, fires that, I as I said, are still burning here more than uh, 13 hours after uh, the, the uh, crash took place. Uh, now, in addition, uh, Pentagon, uh, Pentagon officials insist that they're going to have the building open in the morning, at least uh, large portions of the building on the other side that were not affected by this incident uh, as a symbol that the uh, fact that the U.S. military headquarters has not uh, been shut down by this uh, terrorist action. Wolf? And Jamie, just to remind our viewers, about 20,000 people on a daily basis go to work at the Pentagon, which is, of course, just outside of uh, Washington. It was the Army section of the Pentagon that took the, that took the brunt of this attack, wasn't it? Well, actually, uh, the, the, the hit at the fourth corridor, if you're familiar with the Pentagon from your Pentagon days, uh, in an area that had just been renovated. Uh, that actually is an area where there are a lot of Navy offices. There were also a lot of Army offices along this side of the Pentagon over here uh, that was also affected by the blaze. A couple of uh, interesting notes. Uh, one is that uh, this marks a, a dividing line between where the Pentagon was just completed being renovated and another area that they were just about to start on. That meant that there were fewer people in both of those sections, in one case because some people had not yet moved into new offices, in other case because they had just moved out of old offices. And in the new area, which uh, is on this side and didn't burn as much, uh, some of the new improved fire security uh, systems helped a lot, including a sprinkler system that was installed on one side of the Pentagon had not been installed on the other. That was a big help in keeping the fire down. And, uh, Jamie, while we have you, what have you hear been hearing about troop deployments uh, by the military in the aftermath of this attack? Well, I've only heard of one significant move so far, and that is the decision to uh, uh, hold the USS Enterprise aircraft carrier in the Persian Gulf region. The Enterprise had just been relieved by the Carl Vinson in the Persian Gulf and was on its way home uh, Pentagon sources tell me that uh, orders have been sent to the ship to hold up, uh, to stay in the uh, area of the Arabian Sea and await further orders, uh, a signal that the United States may have something in mind in terms of some sort of a military reaction. Wolf? Jamie McIntyre at the Pentagon. All right, please stand by. I want to go down to Bill Hemmer in Atlanta. He has more on this devastating day. Bill? Yeah, Wolf, well, thank you. On a normal day, and underscore the word normal, because we are far from that at this point. On a normal day, any airline that will go down the U.S. would be given what we would consider wall-to-wall -wall coverage. But today in western Pennsylvania, just another element, another aspect of this still unfolding tragic story. To David Mattingly near Shanksville, Pennsylvania, where United Airlines Flight 93 went down this morning about 10.20 a.m. David, good evening again to you. Good evening, Bill. We are officially in the tiny town of Stony Creek Township, Pennsylvania. That's just outside Shanksville, southeast of Pittsburgh. The FBI here at the crash scene will confirm only one thing, that there were 38 passengers and seven crewmen aboard the United 757 when it crashed here in a field of an old strip mining area. Officials at this location have been reluctant to call it an act of terrorism until evidence is uncovered that actually indicates this. In the meantime, there are hundreds of state troopers and emergency personnel securing the crash site, uh, calling it a crime scene uh, in preparation of a federal investigation. Now, witnesses in the area said the plane 
hit the ground at a 45 degree angle causing a tremendous explosion uh, rattling windows miles away from here all that's left of the 757 appears to be small pieces of debris raising concerns that the investigation here on the ground could be a long and difficult one of course the search is on for the all-important black box the flight recorder there is also a great deal of interest in what could be another key piece of evidence if it proves to be authentic a 911 call originating from the plane and taken by a 911 operator in a Pennsylvania county just west of here, that tape is now in the hands of the FBI. If it proves to be authentic, it could be the lone surviving voice of an eyewitness on board that ill-fated aircraft. And with it, maybe some answers about what happened on board the airplane, and maybe some answers as to why this plane crashed here in this field instead of into another terrorist target. Now, Pennsylvania Governor Tom Ridge surveyed the area earlier today, calling on Pennsylvanians to offer prayer and cooperation. As night fell, we began to see uh, trucks coming by with trailers loaded with equipment that looked like communications equipment and lighting equipment, obviously preparing for a lengthy investigation here. Bill. All right, David, thank you. David Mattingly in Somerset County, Pennsylvania, southeast of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Throughout the evening here, the human face has been put on this tragedy in more ways than one. We're starting to get an idea of some of the people who were on board the various flights that took off today, a partial list of some of the better recognized names on board. David Angel and his wife Lynn from Pasadena, California, the executive producer of NBC's Frasier, Wings and Cheers was on board one of those planes. Daniel Lewin, 31 years old, co-founder of Akamai Technologies. Garnett Bailey, his friends called him Ace, director of scouting for the L.A. Kings, the National Hockey League. Also, Mark Bavis, also a scout with the L.A. Kings. And throughout the night, you've heard the name Barbara Olson being mentioned several times, a frequent contributor to Larry King Live and CNN through her legal commentary. Outside of that, we're also starting to pick up different stories across the country, repercussions from this story, indication that uh, some gas lines in different parts of the country are snaking more than an hour or more in length. Also an indication that some people are afraid of the supply disruption. Nothing confirmed on a disruption of supply, but as a result, some gas stations in Dallas, Texas, five bucks a gallon, Indianapolis.